Bookworm Games, Episode 22, Kraken Open the Pyramid. Welcome back. This is Wesley Schantz. A little down this week, listeners. Uruguay are knocked out of the World Cup after yet another brilliant, brave run by the little country where I taught and where I have some close friends. And then in quick succession, Brazil, Sweden, and Russia followed them out each in descending order of the teams I next would have deigned to root for. Now it's England by default, I guess. I'm amused by the sartorial choices of the England coach, and so you can expect them to be sent packing next. And if you think I have a secret wish there to see Modric host the trophy, I protest that you are reading in a little too much. Don't get me started on France and Belgium. I know, the tournament has been objectively fun to watch, which only makes it worse. And worst of all, that the U.S. did not even make it. But all's not lost. I've got two exciting announcements. You might have seen on Facebook, I've begun contributing to Alexander Schmid's History of Western Thought page. So check it out and like it if the spirit moves you. And you can send comments directly through there, if you have them. Lately, I've been posting links to interesting content, uh, some produced by Alex and our friends, Sarah on Harry Potter, and Oscar on Herodotus, and some writing of my own or from other places. Recently, I put up a long essay responding to Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. The other news, Hobbit Camp starts on Monday, June 9th. June? No, July 9th, 11 a.m. Eastern, 2 Pacific. Oh, I need to not get that mixed up. Uh, Sign up at SignumU slash Academy uh, for a live link to the sessions, or you can find recordings on YouTube later. Uh, I've been teaching Lord of the Rings online since last summer uh, through Signum's affiliated account on the OutSchool platform, and I'm looking forward to these free public sessions, which are in collaboration with local libraries. So following The Hobbit, there will be other Signumites discussing Harry Potter, A Wrinkle in Time, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. So go and sign your kids up. You can also support signumu.org, also mythguard.org. It's much appreciated. With that, let's head to Scaraba. Maybe you remember the billboard guy on the threshold between the summer's main strip, and the neighborhood of Toto. He stands there pronouncing parathetically where you are, and then insisting that he's not a billboard. This might remind you of Liar X Adjurate back in Onet, who does call himself a billboard guy, or of Brick Road from Jeff's Journey Through Winters, and we'll meet him again soon in another form. But it should also remind us of Itoi, the game's creator, who makes his living, among other things, in advertising. Generating excitement and interest about information. Which is sort of what a game does. For the pure billboard guy, it's probably inconsequential whether you actually buy the advertised product. As long as you read and are amused by the billboard. Or if you talk to him in this case, playing on that again. There's the captain on the key in Toto, that's the dock side, glad his wife has come out of the Stoic Club's seriousness back into the sunshine. He's willing now to take you across the sea, since he's got his life back together, and he remarks, perhaps as a result of this experience, or maybe this is how he's, he, his personality had always been before all this happened, He remarks that the only thing you have to lose is your life, and you got that for free. So, very devil may care. And I used to think that was a hairstyle. Devil make hair, like how you look after teleporting, say, uh, with your hair all swept back, like you ride a bicycle without a helmet. So, devil may care. We head out on the captain's little boat with our brave blue pennant flying for a small fee. Out beyond the outlying boats in the harbor, the game shifts to an overworld scale. And we don't see Summers and Toto behind us, only the sea and islands ahead, as we zig and zag through lighter and darker, 
shallower, deeper waters. The captain himself says that you're getting seasick, stops the boat, laughs at your adventurousness, as manifested by the presence of such an interesting young man as Prince Pooh. And then we're on our way again. The graphics in this part of Earthbound are reminiscent of other RPGs, of course, but also of a game called Star Tropics for the NES, where you can travel around the islands by submarine. And even the names of those two games are kind of similar, right? Just like they resemble Undertale, Starbound, Stardew Valley. So something about this is a, a good precedent for names. In Earthbound, you're not directing where the ship goes. And then, for the first time since the dawn after the meteorite night, time passes before our eyes. Day becomes night. And then, in this night sea journey, we get the attack of the Kraken by a volcanic island. So, this is different than the second boss in Star Tropics, which is a giant octopus who kidnapped a dolphin. And it's also different than the polar kraken on the old magic cards, since this one is obviously not polar. Uh, it's akin in that it appears to have a massive size beside the ship, uh, but note that its color is green with some red and purple. Uh, it's got a lack of eyes, and a froth of blood around its fangs. It's more Leviathan or Sea Dragon than Kraken, as I thought of what that was. For more on those figures, I commend the concluding passages of the Book of Job to you. Perhaps some of the mythic stories in the Enuma Elish, which we'll touch upon later in the episode. And, oh, Moby Dick. There's a light summer read for you, but a brilliant and brave one, just like Uruguay's Dear Celeste. Anyway, this made me realize I don't have maybe the best sources for my idea of what a kraken is, uh, or if it's even a made-up thing, where that idea comes from, maybe. Should I look at the very scary almanac? It's in there, all right. Who? Giant octopus. Kraken. What? The biggest known octopi weigh no more than 125 pounds, yet the elusive giant octopus is estimated to weigh at at least 5 tons. Furthermore, the largest octopi known to science have tentacles 10 to 12 feet long. The kraken, according to legend, has tentacles up to 100 feet long long enough to grab a ship, and strong enough to pull it under water. Where? Legends of the Kraken abound in Norway and Scandinavia. There's your polar Kraken. But similar creatures have been reported in the western Bahamas and other island nations. Alright, so there we go. Cryptozoologists assume that if these creatures do exist, they live in the deepest parts of the ocean. Okay, so, like anyone who wants to find something out, I went ahead and looked it up on Wikipedia, which, in this case, offers some really great sources. So I hope I'm attributing them properly here. I am accessing Wikipedia. It's July 8th, 2018, and the page on Kraken reads, okay, Etymology. The English word Kraken is taken from Norwegian, in Norwegian, kraken is the definite form of kraka, a word designating an unhealthy animal or something twisted. Cognate with the English crook and crank. In modern German, kraka, plural and declined singular kraken, means octopus, but can also refer to the legendary kraken. Okay, so I think I'm etymologically sound here in thinking about octopus-shaped things rather than sea dragon-shaped things. Um, interesting note on the biology. They remark on Wikipedia, Kraken, although similar to the octopus, only have seven appendages. Okay. Still not clear on whether this is a real or fantastic 
legendary uh, so history. In the late 13th century version of the old Icelandic saga Urvar Aldar is an inserted episode of a, of a journey bound for Helluland, Baffin Island, which takes the protagonist through the Greenland Sea, and here they spot two massive sea monsters called Havguva, Sea Mist, and Lingbakr, Heatherback. The Havguva is believed to be a reference to the Kraken. Nu mun ek seja there at feta erusias grimi si twao. Okay, I'll spare you my old Norse. Now I will tell you that there are two sea monsters. One is called the Hafgufa, sea mist, another Lingbakr, heatherback. The Lingbakr is the largest whale in the world, but the Hafgufa is the hugest monster in the sea. It is the nature of this creature to swallow men and ships, and even whales and everything else within reach. It stays submerged for days, then rears its head and nostrils above the surface and stays that way, at least until the change of tide. Now that sound we just sailed through was the space between its jaws, and its nostrils and lower jaw were those rocks that appeared in the sea, while the Lingbacker was the island we saw sinking down. However, Ogmund Tussock has sent these creatures to you by means of his magic to cause the death of you and all your men. He thought more men would have gone the same way as those who had already drowned, and he expected that the Havgufa would have swallowed us all. Today I sailed through its mouth because I knew that it had recently surfaced. So that's pretty awesome. Um, there's some historical references below that. And then there's a note here that Alfred Tennyson published the irregular sonnet, The Kraken, in 1830. Oh, man, and these pictures along the side are really pretty awesome. I suggest you check them out. An old illustration from the original 1870 edition of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. All right, but the, but the poem. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. Faintest sunlights flee about his shadowy sides. Above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height. And far away into the sickly light, from many a wondrous grot and secret cell, unnumbered and enormous polypy, winnow with giant arms the slumbering queen. Dang it green. There hath he lain for ages, and will lie, battening upon huge sea-worms in his sleep, until the latter fire shall heat the deep. Then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise, and on the surface die. Poem from Alfred Lord Tennyson of Ulysses fame. Uh, in Herman Melville's, this is what they say next here, 1851 novel Moby Dick, chapter 59. Squid, the Pequod, encounters what Chief Mate Starbuck refers, uh, identifies as the, the great live squid, which, they say, few whale ships ever beheld and returned to their ports to tell of it. Narrator Ishmael adds, There seems some ground to imagine that the, giant, the great kraken of Bishop Pontopadon, sick, may ultimately resolve itself into squid. He concludes the chapter by adding, By some naturalists who have va vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish, which indeed, in certain external respects, it would seem to belong, but only as the anak of the tribe. So, uh, there's, of course, many pop culture references, but those are your classic culture ones, I think, um, in the early historic one. I, I, I would point out the resemblance there to the Scylla and Charybda, the two sea monster idea, but uh, clearly the reference there is more to a, a whale type of thing as contrasted with a squid type of thing, and the sense in which those are both the um, kind of archetypal, if you like, uh, sea monsters is, is rather interesting to me that um, there's this kind of division between these two different uh, ancient, horrible 
sea monsters, they don't resolve themselves into a single image. Anyway, that's how it looks to me. So I find that rather interesting. Um, for some reason, back in Earthbound, fighting the Kraken, the music is of a sort I would describe as technology groovy music, and I think it's the same song that's last heard when you fight against the Smile and Sphere enemy in Dusty Dunes Desert. It's maybe a better question, uh, not why this music here, but why this music back against such a lowly Smile and Sphere? Why would he get such cool music? Um, what do these two enemies have in common? Well, of course, we just mentioned Jules Verne and sci-fi with its technological uh, emphasis emerged from his stories. So I guess we're seeing the origin of that here. Um, the Kraken enemy will also reappear in Ness's mind in Magicant near the center where Ness's shadow awaits. And if I'm not getting this mixed up, a bionic Kraken will appear occasionally towards the very end of the game in the Cave of the Past when you're approaching Gigas. So there is some kind of relationship here between the horrors of nature and the horrors of technology, I guess. Um, neither enemy, Smile and Sphere, Kraken, neither has eyes and both smile. Um, both have unexpectedly, in the Kraken's case, rather low hit points or HP. And fortunately, when you do defeat Kraken, it does not explode. So no exploding whale here. Though, again, I can't recall whether the bionic Kraken later does. Uh, so when you win, the sailor congratulates you on your victory, and he mentions that he helped out. He's not sure if you noticed. He threw his slippers at the enemy. Uh, this reminds me of our neighbor Pokey's mother, Lardna Minch, smashing Buzz Buzz. Perhaps. Anyway. Light returns. A new day. The boat pulls into the purple, wine-dark sea of Scarabah, back at the normal zoom level that we're accustomed to. And stepping off the boat, and sweating immediately, because we're not in town yet, um, we arrive in Scarabah. The name refers uh, to Scarab Beetle, so again, reminds me of Buzz Buzz. And of course, that makes me think about Egypt. And it also sounds a bit like uh, Arabia. So you've got that other general Middle Eastern, North African desert vibe going on. And Arabic culture seems to be the background for Scaraba. So in terms of real world geography, I think what we've just done is travel from the French Riviera or possibly somewhere in southern Italy. Uh, over to Egypt, maybe? Morocco? Anyway, we've crossed the Mediterranean, is what it seems like. So, here's something I noticed. Uh, I distinctly remember realizing this, actually, back when I was playing the game as a kid. And then later, I made a little experiment to test it. I noticed that Scaraba's music is what sounds like a remix of the music from Onet, the first town, your hometown. It may even be bar for bar. Um, and so to test this, I took some MIDI, um, that's a format, M-I-D-I, files, uh, music files that people had made and uploaded on starman.net, downloaded those uh, using a sheet music notation software that I had. Um, I opened the Onet music file as sheet music. The, the Scaraba music, uh, and I had them both there, and then I started to look at them, and I thought, well, yeah, these kind of fit together nicely, so I'll take this, and I'll move it over here, and I'll cut this part out, because it sounds bad, so anyway, I started to do a mashup, copying and pasting to see how it would sound, you know? Um, I don't have particular musical training, but uh, I was just kind of messing around with this, and um, I found this, I saved it, and, and so I found it just now. And I converted the MIDI file to an MP3, thanks again, Internet, so that I could include it here. Um, see what you think.
think that's pretty cool myself, not to toot my own horn, but I did include there at the end, maybe you'll hear it, the haunting melody from our third episode, I think, uh, comes from the trumpet player in Onet, uh, and is a version of Dvorak's Largo melody, uh, from the, the Ninth Symphony. Anyway, now, playing through Scaraba, I've noticed more connections to previous towns beyond the musical echoes. People here evidently speak your language, or again, your sigh abilities translate for you, making your meaning lucid to one another. One of the first people you meet uh, levitating at the top of a rope, or maybe he's sitting on the edge of a roof up there, I'm not sure, it's hard to tell. He mentions that he misplaced a key to his friend Dungeon Man, and that's Brick Road. If you recall, he was going to get Dr. And Donut's help to become, and not just make, his next dungeon. So, he's around here somewhere, but we don't know where the key is yet. Anyway, this friend at the top of the rope also reminds me of Ness's friends up in their treehouse. Over in the trees northeast of town, someone tells you to watch where you step, because a chubby kid did his business out here, and if you... Use your check command on the scat that you see there. The message appears, Pokey's stink hangs in the air. Geographically, again, this is where your house and Pokey's would be, uh, with reference to Onet. So that checks out. You're on the trail. This is his spore. Uh, this is where he has passed and left his mark uh, of Pokey. Your arrival from the north also then would correspond to buzz buzzes, uh, and your boat would be like the meteorite or the beam of light, if it's that that he arrives on. In arriving from the resort town and its, its barrio, you've come back from the future, in a sense. You've come from a more sophisticated, anyway, uh, sort of place to a less sophisticated place. You've got Scarabuzz Bazaar, though, which looks a lot like Berglin Park, down to the seasonings salesman. Uh, instead of fresh eggs and the for sale sign, though, the most useful commodities here are snakes and piggy nose. In that respect, uh, outdoor markets, um, they represent a point of connection across cultures. We love to get out in the open air and haggle. There's a street market I used to uh, see them set up outside our house in Uruguay uh, one day a week. Um, and so just like we had to let the people there know that someone was actually renting the house now, and so please leave us some room to come in and out through the doorway, uh, the people in the houses in Scaraba like to tell you and your party, no, no thanks, we don't want to buy any momi wrap today. Um, I don't have anything for you, so get out of my house. Things like this. Uh, the arms dealer in the hotel is just like the one you first met back in Threed, behind the hotel, telling you to keep on the watch for bad guys. The overall impression, then, is of a... This is an exotic place, no doubt, but it is also a place like home in many ways. That cosmopolitan aspiration of Earthbound that I've spoken of before, uh, it's reinforced in this case by all those conveniences of a modern hospital and ATM, and in general, as always, uh, you are safe talking to most people in town unless they have blue faces. Then you run the other way. But in Scaraba, I don't think there's any blue-faced enemies to be found. Um, so you're protected from the dangers of the wild until you walk out into the sudden shock of the desert beyond the walled perimeter of Scaraba town. So venturing out into this desert, you... Uh, can tell from the music and the sweat that springs from your party that lets you know that you're somewhere else. You have no way of knowing how brief this desert will turn out to be. However, after encountering just one or two foes, uh, reprises of bukas and scalpions from the Dusty Dunes desert, and, if you're lucky, of the criminal caterpillar's successor, the master criminal worm, or if you're not lucky, if you just know where to walk back and forth down there by that little oasis from screen to screen until you see it, and then you can chase it for tons of experience points if you catch it. Uh, anyway, 
quite shortly you come to a water merchant out there in the desert with his camel who will claim to be very helpful, but actually he only is insofar as you might need PP, psychic points, uh, not hydration, because that's not really actually something the game tracks. Um, Pooh's ability to steal PP from foes using his Psi Magnet may prove even more important unless you do decide to stock up on enough water or you brought along some magic tarts to restore your psychic points during the pyramid. Anyway, for there, just beyond the merchant reposes the Sphinx before the pyramid doors, which are adorned with what looks like eyes. Uh, maybe these are the ones missing from the Kraken. Or maybe they just allude to the one called Hawkeye in the ancient texts. Thief or warrior is the Sphinx's basic question. Essentially, the right answer, as it turns out, is first, scholar, uh, at least museum-goer, so as to know about the hint with the numbers 1 through 5 arranged in that strange-looking way on the hieroglyph. And second... Not thief, not warrior, but dancer, because what you must do is dance in a star pattern on those conspicuous spots arrayed before the impassive face. When you do it right, you get some cool sound effects, which piece themselves together a bit like a mini soundstone. It's arranged in a star, but not a circle. Otherwise, it looks kind of similar. And it culminates in the Sphinx addressing you as warrior and bidding you enter. Then the pyramid doors open. So, for all the intense pyramid exploration music that we get on entering the pyramid, it's a deceptively easy dungeon at first, so long as you have gone through those two sanctuary spots already and leveled up a bit, or maybe just fought a few master criminal worms or whatever. There's a linear series of rooms, like the ones that lead from Threed over to Grapefruit Falls in the secret passageway under the cemetery. Only these in the pyramid have better decor. You've got hieroglyphic wisdom adorning the walls and better coffins. Then you come to the central chamber, where the choices branch from the room with its suspicious sarcophagus in the middle. These choices, as you take them, will necessitate retracing your steps. No matter which way you go first, you're going to have to come back to the central room. And that means refighting the hieroglyph enemies, which start to add up, and the petrified temple guards who launch themselves at you in their open caskets. If you go to the left first, you can recover some Dragonite, which is awesome. And if you fight enough enemies, you're bound to rack up the mummy wraps, the vipers, which might be worth it, but these battles seriously began to wear my party down, at least. Finally, pressing onto the right, you come to the hidden pressure panel on the floor of a distant room, which, another cool sound effect, reveals a way down through that hole which you could sort of see under the sarcophagus in the middle whenever the screen goes into battles, uh, which it does over and over again. Anyway, curiously enough, drop down that hole. After all that, you're given a choice whether or not to take the hawk eye, the treasure hidden in the pyramid. This is an insistent element of the game, as we've seen from the very start. Given a choice, and then you have to say yes or no to the choice. So within this great adventure of heroic destiny sort of framework, your choices really matter. And in this case, it is a real choice. You can actually, like my friend Steve, I think, did once, proceed with the game without taking the Hawkeye from its pedestal. I forget whether he had his inventory full at the time, or he just didn't check it, or he was afraid it was a trap, Indiana Jones style, or what... But Steve left it there in its underground resting place, proceeded with the game, and managed to get through. I recommend you take it, though. 
uh, as the help option will helpfully explain, you can see in the dark. Uh, this game could probably have prompted players a bit more strongly here by, say, having the next few rooms of the pyramid uh, be plunged into darkness unless you use the Hawkeye to dispel it. I have no idea, now that I am thinking about it, where the light actually comes from in the pyramid. Um, those paths under Threed and, and under Stonehenge, of course, glow with some strange light of their own, but the pyramid seems oh, evenly lit as anyone's house uh, by its warm sandstone backgrounds, and this weirdly allows you to see down there. I, I guess there's no reason other than simplicity's sake. Um, in the mythological sense, though, wouldn't that mean that you can already see in the dark? In some sense. Anyway, for more on that mythological uh, concept of the hawk eye and the recovery of it by a vibrant young hero um, going down to get the value that's dormant within the decrepit old pyramid of culture, I think uh, our, our, our authors of late, uh, Eric Neumann, Jordan Peterson, these authors I've been reading lately with uh, Alex Schmid over at the History of Western Culture. Am I getting that right? I think maybe it's History of Western Thought. I, I'm, I'm bad with names. Sorry. History of Western Thought uh, site. They suggest that we look into some stories of the descent to the underworld by Horus and Osiris. So let me read a little... About this story for you. This comes from Peterson's 1999 work, Maps of Meaning, about which I put out that long review just now. All right. The story of Osiris and his son Horus is much more complex in some ways than the Mesopotamian creation myth or the story of Ray and describes the interactions between the constituent elements of experience in exceedingly compressed form. Osiris was a primeval king, a legendary ancestral figure, who ruled Egypt wisely and fairly. His evil brother, Seth, whom he did not understand, rose up against him. Seth kills Osiris, that is, sends him to the underworld, and dismembers his body so that it can never be found. The death of Osiris signifies two important things. The tendency of a static, ruling idea, system of valuation, or a particular story, no matter how initially magnificent or appropriate, to become increasingly irrelevant with time. And second, the dangers that necessarily accrue to a state that forgets or refuses to admit to the existence of the immortal deity of evil. Seth, the king's brother and opposite, represents the mythic hostile twin or adversary who eternally opposes the process of creation, creative encounter with the unknown. He signifies, alternatively speaking, a pattern of adaptation characterized by absolute opposition to establishment of divine order. When this principle gains control, that is, usurps the throne, the rightful king and his kingdom are necessarily doomed. Seth and figures like him often represented in narrative by the corrupt right-hand man or advisor to the once great king, view human existence itself with contempt. Such figures are motivated only to protect or advance their position in the power hierarchy, even when the prevailing order is clearly counterproductive. Their actions necessarily speed the process of decay, endemic to all structures. Osiris, although great, was naive in some profound sense, blind, at least, to the existence of immortal evil. This blindness and its resultant incaution brings about, or at least hastens, Osiris' demise. Now I'd interpose there that I think Neumann understands the right-hand man a little differently as a right-hand man not primarily of the rightful king, but of the great mother, um, if I got that right from reading his uh, Origins in History of Consciousness. But anyway, Peterson goes on to discuss this great mother a little bit. Osiris has a wife, 
as befits the king of order. Isis, as Osiris' mythic counterpart, is representative of the positive aspect of the unknown, like the hero duel in the Mesopotamian New Year's ritual. She is possessed of great magical powers, as might be expected given her status. She gathers up Osiris' scattered pieces and makes herself pregnant with the use of his dismembered phallus. The story makes a profound point. The degeneration of the state or domain of order and its descent into chaos serves merely to fructify that domain and to make it pregnant. In chaos lurks great potential. When a great organization disintegrates, falls into pieces, the pieces might still usefully be fashioned into or give rise to something else, perhaps something more vital and still greater. greater. Isis, therefore, gives birth to a son, Horus, who returns to his rightful kingdom to confront his evil uncle. This process is schematically presented... Uh, blah, blah, sorry... These figures, I'm skipping them. They're, they're so silly to me, at least. Anyway, F Horus um, fights a, deadly, a difficult battle with Seth, as the forces of evil are difficult to overcome, and loses an eye in the process. Seth is overcome, nonetheless. Horus recovers his eye. The story could stop there. Narrative integrity intact, with the now whole and victorious Horus well-deserved ascension to the throne. However... Horus does the unexpected, descending voluntarily to the underworld to find his father. It is representation of this move, reminiscent of Marduk's voluntary journey to the underworld of Tiamat, that constitutes the brilliant and original contribution of Egyptian theology. We'll discuss Marduk in a sec here, sorry. Just to finish this out, Horus discovers Osiris extant in a state of torpor. He offers his recovered eye to his father so that Osiris can see once again. They return united and victorious and establish a revivified kingdom. The kingdom of the son and father is an improvement over that of the father or the son alone. As it unites the hard-won wisdom of the past, that is, of the dead, with the adaptive capacity of the present, that is, of the living. The re-establishment and improvement of the domain of order. Blah, 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 sorry. In the story of Osiris, the senescence or death of the father, presented as a consequence of the treachery of Seth, is overcome by the mythic son, the hero who temporarily defeats the power of evil, and who rejuvenates the father. So back to Marduk. Marduk, the Mesopotamian supreme god, is by comparison a straightforward hero. He carves the familiar world from the unfamiliar. To go into that a, a slight bit more, he defeats, as we're told, the dragon of chaos who precedes the anthropomorphic gods of the Babylonian canon. Marduk uh, catches her in a net and breathes fiery magic words and uh, dices her up and makes the earth from her body. If I've got that wrong, I'm sorry, but that's how I understand it. Um, so that's your your leviathan, your sea dragon, um, which is what the kraken looks a little more like. Um, encountering it in the night, defeating it, and then the dawning of day, representing the light of the intellect of, of consciousness and, and the better uh, side of humanity, if you like. So anyway, He's comparatively straightforward to Horus, who's equally brave, is more complete and more sophisticated. He cannot remain content with his own ascension, feeling himself incomplete without his father. He therefore journeys voluntarily into the underworld, releases the disintegrated forces of tradition trapped there, and makes them part of himself. This pattern of behavior constitutes an elaboration of that represented by Marduk, or of Re, the Egyptian sun god. Marduk creates order from chaos. That capacity, which is theoretically embodied in the form of the Mesopotamian emperor, lends temporal authority its rightful power. The same idea, elaborated substantially, applies in Egypt. Osiris constitutes the old state, once great, but dangerously anachronistic. Horus partakes of the essence of tradition. He is the son of his father, but is vivified by an infusion of new information, his mother, after all, is the positive aspect of the unknown. As an updated version of his father, he is capable of dealing with the problems of the present, that is, with the emergent evil represented by his uncle. 
victorious over his uncle, he is nonetheless incomplete, as his youthful spirit lacks the wisdom of the past, so he journeys into the unknown, where his father rests lifeless, that is, uncomprehended, without embodiment or incarnation in action in the present. Horus unites himself with his father and becomes the ideal ruler, the consciousness of present youthful life conjoined with the wisdom of tradition. Yeah. I, I'll stop there. That's some some stirring stuff, huh? Um, oh, I do have a few more sections to read. Hold on. Uh, Peterson goes on at the conclusion of his Apprenticeship and Enculturation chapter 3 of Maps of Meaning. He says, The optimal wise king to whom subordination might be regarded as necessary must therefore either be an individual whose identity is nested within a hierarchy whose outermost territory is occupied by the exploratory hero, or a group about which the same might be said. So the ideal group or master might be conceptualized once again as Osiris, the traditions of the past, nested within Horus Rei, the process that originally created those traditions and which presently updates them. This means that the meta-problem of adaptation what is the nature of the behavioral procedure that leads to the establishment of and rank ordering of valid forms of how to behave, that leads to successful adaptation as such, has been answered by groups who ensure that their traditions, admired and imitated, are nonetheless subordinate to the final authority of the creative hero. So the highest good becomes imitation worship of the process represented by the hero, who, as the ancient Sumerians stated, restores all ruined gods as though they were his own creation. All right, and then just one more passage here. Later in the chapter, the Hostile Brothers, as Peterson is getting into his discussion of Solzhenitsyn, uh, which is fascinating, um, although I haven't read much of his work um, What's quoted here is great. Then he, he remarks, okay, the process of voluntary engagement in the revaluation of good and evil, consequent to recognition of personal insufficiency and suffering, is equivalent to adoption of identification with Horus, who, as the process that renews, exists as something superordinate to the morality of the past. This means that the capacity to reassess morality means identification with the figure that generates and renews the world, with the figure that mediates between order and chaos. It is within the domain of that figure that room for all aspects of the personality actually exist, as the demands placed on the individual who wishes to identify with the Savior are so high, so to speak, that every aspect of personality must become manifested, redeemed, and integrated into a functioning hierarchy. The revaluation of good and evil, therefore, allows for the creative reintegration of those aspects of personality and their secondary representations in imagination and idea, previously suppressed and stunted by immature moral ideation, including that represented by group affiliation, posited as the highest level of ethical attainment. Wow, I mean... For me, that's that's great stuff um, that's buried in this long book. Uh, but if you can excavate that, man, that's something. Um, I think that although uh, Earthbound represents this in kind of a fantastic and often silly manner, uh, it's no less silly than some of the diagrams that Peterson puts in his big book there, and at least Earthbound is never uh, pedantic about it. But these are these are quibbles. I mean, I really really admire the work that is is happening in Maps of Meaning and in Peterson's uh, live discussions and and the whole phenomenon that's risen up around it. I mean, that's kind of what got me into podcasting uh, through Alex's recommendation. Anyway. I also think that Earthbound represents this in that meta sense that Peterson talks about there of that which updates the process, that consciousness of the process of updating, which one can identify with or worship. I don't know that those are quite the same thing, but, but they do seem related. Anyway, uh, Earthbound uh, 
represents this as well because it continually points beyond itself. It points towards that process. And I think quite uh, ludically, again, in, in game and not discursively. Um, anyhow, that's how it looks to me. I don't know uh, how well all this mythological stuff uh, fits with the Space Invaders story um, from the museum hieroglyphs and the ancient scriptures of Dalam, but, uh, but there's something there, right? There's the sense that the past is aiding the present and that the present goes down into the past in order to produce the future, something like that, right? The hawk eye that, that recovers the blindness of the old king, so to speak allows you to see in the darkness, which allows you to be creative, all this sort of thing. Anyway, it's fitting then that before exiting out the far end of the pyramid, because there's no going back once you've dropped down uh, to the Hawkeye's level, the only way is forward. Uh, before you leave, there's a boss fight against a closed sarcophagus, which holds the captain of the temple guards you've been fighting all along. And finally, so let's call him Seth for a name, say. Finally, beyond there, awaits a magic butterfly. It's likely lost its way, uh, coming in from the other end of the pyramid tunnel in southern Scaraba, through which you shortly come out. And there, as you're leaving, the Star Master swoops in to congratulate you and to borrow Prince Pooh to teach him what he had not yet learned when Pooh was confronting his ancestral spirits at the place of Mu, of nothingness. It's too bad, uh, because Pooh was likely uh, playing a very integral role just now in your heroes making it through that long pyramid. Um, but you'll have to do without his Psy versatility and his water drinking abilities for now. He promises to return as soon as he can. So, we fought the Kraken and struggled with its ambivalent nature of octopus, sea monster, dragon, not sure exactly still, but uh, that seems to be part of what makes it so terrifying after all. It's very uh, mysteriousness. I spared you guys long quotations from Moby Dick uh, and the Book of Job, but I do commend those to you. Um, we talked briefly about Scaraba and its culture, and then the Sphinx and the Pyramid with our myths of Horus primarily, Marduk secondarily. Again, Maps of Meaning, fascinating book. Uh, you can check out my review on the history of Western thought. Again, sorry, got that mixed up. And then uh, next time, we will encounter Dungeon Man. We've heard little bits and pieces about him where we began with the billboard, so we'll continue uh, with another billboard guy, Dungeon Man, next time. Till then, take care. Thanks for listening. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.